Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you all for joining today. Um, we have a great session teed up, and uh, I sincerely thank all of you and hope that, first of all, you are all keeping healthy and safe. Um, my name is Michael Park. I'm a senior partner with McKinsey and leader of McKinsey Academy. And today's virtual exchange session is all about the path to the next normal. Uh, at the core, I just want to start with COVID-19 is first and foremost a humanitarian crisis. Uh, but it's also a crisis to our livelihoods and economies as well. And so today we want to exchange ideas about what leaders should be doing and thinking about to lead their respective institutions and teams. Uh, and you know, how do we go beyond resolve and resilience, but actually move towards strengthening our teams and coming out of this crisis stronger, more resilient, more energized. Uh, so with that, as we all get settled into our virtual uh, Zoom, uh, let's go to the next chart. And I'd ask people to share a little bit about themselves and introduce themselves virtually. So if you would take a moment and use the powers of Zoom and uh, tell us where are you joining us from, annotate on the map. Uh, and secondly, put in the chat, what do you want to get out of this session or any thoughts that you have that you'd like to share with the broader group? We'll let the answers flow in for a few seconds and then we'll, uh, I'll introduce my colleague and speaker. Terrific. I see a lot of the answers coming through and I'm sure we'll get more and more of this uh, as, as the technology flows, but it looks like a very global audience and uh, we couldn't be more thrilled to have this group on the, uh, on the webinar. So without further ado, let me introduce to you our speaker. Uh, and honestly, I can't think of a better person to join us here today than Kevin. Kevin is our managing partner and has a long career advising CEOs across industries and geographies. And one thing I would stress is that he takes a real global perspective. Uh, he has spent his professional career USA, Europe, Asia, spending real time there, as well as working with CEOs from across the world. And so with that, Kevin, welcome, uh, and thanks for joining us. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Terrific. So let's get started. Uh, Kevin, um, maybe we just start with, you know, how has COVID affected you as a leader, uh, both personally and professionally? Oh, gosh. Um, well, personally, it's had a pretty significant impact. I, uh, I live in Hong Kong. And on January the 5th, I left Hong Kong for what I thought would be a two-week trip. It included the World Economic Forum in Davos. And my wife and I uh, were then going to meet, along with our younger daughter, in Glasgow to celebrate my father's 80th birthday, which we did. So we headed to, so we headed to Glasgow. And while we were in Scotland, we got the news that my daughter's school in Hong Kong was going to temporarily close. We thought for a couple of weeks. So we made the decision that we probably should just stay in Europe. So we did. We stayed for what we thought would be a couple of weeks. Well, since then, I think it's safe to say things have got rather elongated. So my daughter's school that closed somewhere around January 25th, 27th, hasn't gone back. And we're now being told it probably won't go back. Officially, it's now May the 20 something is the date for schools to reopen in Hong Kong. But of course, that's almost the end of the term there. So in reality, she's not going back to school. She's a senior, so there'll be no problem, none of the end of year events that they like to do there. Uh, and that, at one level, is just a very small example of the unexpected. I certainly didn't think I'd be leaving Hong Kong at the beginning of January and be on the road ever since. Uh, and now to the other unexpected bit, before I answer your question uh, with the gravity it deserves, as, and I'm now living with my mother-in-law and father-in-law, and I never expected that either, because we haven't been able to go back to Hong Kong, so we're now sheltering in place at their place. And so I am literally in the kitchen here at my uh, in-laws. That was not part of the plan. Um, so it's had, a, it's had an effect at a very trivial level. For me, it's had a much more profound effect than so many others. And I should begin by saying, I hope everyone here is staying well. And I, I send you my best thoughts and everything that you're doing to no doubt help attack this crisis in your companies and to look after your families on a personal level. On a professional level, of course, it's been unlike anything I've seen. And if anything tells you otherwise, I think they are truly imagining things because I've never experienced anything of this scale in terms of the global pandemic, the health crisis that it represents. I've never seen anything like this in terms of the shutdown of the global economy. Uh, and it really is a shutdown in many parts of the world. And I've never seen anything that's had the differential impact that it's had across sectors and across geographies. It is also true that in the midst of all that's happening, there are some businesses that are extraordinarily busy. 
uh, the technology sector has proven to be a backbone for a lot of what we all re now rely on. The fact that we're gathering together means that some of the players in that sector are finding themselves never busier than they are now. At the same time, the trauma it's created, the fear, the anxiety is unprecedented. So it clearly has had a truly uh, distinctive impact in a very negative sense in so many, so many ways. It's also brought out, brought out the best of people, and I'd love to share more about that, but I know that's not where you're going, Michael. But of course, I'm sure like you, I have seen amazing acts of caring, kindness, and the human spirit at its best, but it is a profoundly disruptive event. And I suspect we'll get into just how disruptive momentarily. No, I think that resonates uh, deeply. Um, there are so many uh, cognitive dissonance moments, I feel like, in, in all of this. Um, Kevin, you know, what are some of the things you're hearing from CEOs and leaders around the world? What lessons you know, might we draw in these first few months of this disruption? Well, having wrestled with this now for coming on 11, 12 weeks in a personal level, I've been struck by the, the series of steps that the conversation tends to go through. The initial part of the conversation, I think, could be summarized in three C's. It's about colleagues, customers, and cash. So when I first started to dialogue with CEOs, whether they were in China or whether they were over here, they, and I say over here because I'm currently in the US, I think we were initially very much focused rightly on understanding how are our colleagues? Are they safe? Are they well? What do we need to do to make sure that they are safe and well? And how do we deal with the reality that some colleagues may be safe, but they're not well? How do we look after them? How do we cope with those who have COVID-19? And a whole set of efforts went into establishing protocols and of course, looking after people. Then as the attention turned to customers, it shifted to have we got our remote working, working from home, whatever phrase we're using, have we got that working in a way that allows us to maintain obviously close dialogue with each other, but also serve our customers, no matter what sector you're in. This massive move to online working or remote working Possible in some sectors, not possible in others, as we're seeing with the hospitality industry and all the devastation it's reaped across restaurants, hotels, travel, I could go on. But nevertheless, it was customers and colleagues. And then the realization, cash, we're going to need cash. We have to keep our businesses going. We have to pay our people. We have to survive as an organization. And the desperate fight for some to really ensure they have enough cash until government steps in. That was that first phase. I think that was the response phase. Uh, we talk about five hours. It really was the, the very first step, the response. What's our response going to be? How fast are we going to move? Are we going to preempt government or wait for government to tell us what to do? That was the immediate focus. Then there was a step, which I think I, a lot of CEOs started to talk to me about, which is, okay, I think I've tackled the immediate crisis, but you know what? We've got a lot to do just to keep this business moving. That's the resilience step when a lot of CEOs started to ask themselves questions around how do we just make sure we're able to do what we do or not able to do what we do because we have to shut down but shut down in a disciplined and thoughtful way so we can reopen in due course that was the resilience step that we've got to take some actions that are really tough require a lot of personal resilience but they're there to build the business so it can survive increasingly though I think we're across the world Europe's probably three weeks ahead of the US and of course, China and Asia are quite some distance ahead of all of us in terms of the step of considering the return. But it's starting to happen. How do I contemplate going back? It seems almost impossible to do that when you think about 1.5 million confirmed cases around the world. When you think of the devastation, you think of the sheer size of the numbers that we're talking about. Uh, the UK, 56,000 cases. The United States, 400,000 cases, just to use today's numbers. But nevertheless, people are beginning to ask questions about how do we think about the return? And not only ask those questions, but how do we think about the return in light of the fact that China is now at a place where, for example, Wuhan, which was the center of the original outbreak, is going back to, not normalcy, but going back to some form of active life where they're reopening the boundaries, they're able to reopen the shops and so on. So the return is now very much on the agenda quietly but on the agenda and as we look at that notion of a return i think and i'm sure we'll get into this in more detail so i'll just hit some high level points there's a growing realization it's not going to be we announce we go back in a day and all together now we go back it's about waves it's about how we manage a return that's going to take place gradually and over a prolonged period and that's what you know i hear a lot of ceos asking about and i'm beginning to hear ceos ask about you know, I don't think we're going back to what we had before. 
and this is the notion we've been talking about, the next normal. The normal that we had ain't coming back. Happy to elaborate on why I say that, but it ain't coming back. The question is, what's normal going to look like? What's that next normal going to be? What are the contours? How's it going to feel? What's it going to look like? And so people are beginning to reimagine what that future will look like. And as they imagine what that future will look like, that next normal, they draw inspiration from China, but recognize China will be very different from the US, which will be quite different from Europe because of the way they've tackled this challenge, this crisis. And as they imagine, they start to think about, well, how do I build a business for the future rather than recreating the one I had in the past when everything about me has changed? People are going to talk about before coronavirus and after coronavirus. So I think that's something we should all have in our heads. And as we talk about that, we're also going to have to think about the reality, the last five, last hour, that reform. I don't think the world's going to accept a return to the old order. This is a restructuring, a reordering that's going to be deep and profound. It's going to change the role of government. It's going to change regulation. It's going to change the attitude of citizens to business. And because of that, reform is going to happen. And as reform happens, how we reimagine our businesses needs to reflect that. So I think there's going to be five very different steps, and they're all playing out differently across the world, Michael, I'm happy to get into any one of them. But I think those are the kind of things CEOs have to and are contemplating in these challenging days. No, that's great, Kevin. Um, you know, you, 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 you made mention of a few times differences in geographies. And I'm just looking at the annotated uh, screen that's now flipfully taken advantage of the 200 plus people we have here. And it's a truly global audience, uh, you know, Africa, Middle East, North America, Europe, uh, even India and Asia, despite the time zone. Uh, and I would just maybe ask back to you, Kevin, um, anything that just notable examples as you think about different parts of the world uh, that have acted differently, particularly as you think about the reform and the, the return pieces of the five R's, what have you seen that surprised you a little bit or just examples for inspiration? Well, I think the part of what's going to be different is shaped by the way in which the crisis has unfolded and the way in which countries have chosen to tackle the crisis and choices they make within that. Let me give you a simple example. We can note the way that China has been able to lock down, isolate, attack this crisis and do so using the full force of technology and many other factors. But as many of you will know, I, I live in Hong Kong, I've already mentioned this. When I go back to Hong Kong, I will arrive at the Hong Kong International Airport, I hope, when they resume flights sometimes in, sometime in the late May period, which is what they've announced. As I arrive, if I go by what they were doing to people who were arriving before they shut down most of the international flights at the beginning of this month, you were basically swiped, literally the back of your throat. You were checked your temperature and you were given... Uh, a band, a little bracelet. And that bracelet had on it access to an app. And the app was installed in your phone and you paced out your apartment so that they could tell the boundaries within which you would conduct self-quarantine. And if you left those boundaries, you committed an offense. Now, in making those decisions, a whole set of assumptions were made about surveillance and the acceptable boundaries and how people think about privacy. But you have to say that's one way of handling lockdowns. As Wuhan lifts its restrictions, there's an app that tracks where you've been, who you've met with, and therefore your status in terms of risk. That makes assumptions around privacy. As you reflect on the way in which those help maintain the success of the quarantine and the isolation and all that goes with it, you have to understand the context in which that's being done and ask, would that be acceptable and adopted in the United States or in Europe? And people have just a different perspective. So some of the statements people make about we should just apply what they did here, there and everywhere have to be taken in the context. In South Korea, one of the things that that country has done astonishingly well is testing. And they have drive-through testing, they have walk-in testing, they have remote testing, they've got all sorts of ways to test. And they've done that through the application of technology, but again, through a massive mobilization of government. Again, different countries have different ways of doing that. If you think about the way in which companies are going to be prioritized for the return, well, you start thinking, okay, how do we think about that prioritization? Do you bring back those who are most able to do work 
digitally and remotely, or do you bring back those who are not? Actually, you probably want to bring back those who are not, because they may be essential industries that can only operate if people are in person. Yeah. Well, if you do that, how am I going to bring them back? Do I bring back groups of people? Do I bring back individuals? What happens if there's another case? How do I steward that? And we're seeing those issues being worked real time in China, where they tend to be moving from what I would call mass return to group return. Teams of people that return for a seven to 10 day period, which inevitably means you can't bring everything back online at once. I was hearing the example of one of the leading automakers, electric vehicle makers, who have a wonderful business and actually there is a return and they've got their people back. But one of the key parts comes from Italy. Well, of course, that means that they cannot bring their whole business back because that part isn't arriving. And so you have to recognize those differences dictate how the return is going to happen. Of course, there are lots of lessons around how that first phase, how you handle the outbreak, how you deal with the response, like talk to public health. Happy to get into that. But I think from a business point of view and an economic point of view, the key difference is shape the way in which this pandemic is going to be dealt with from an economic viewpoint as well as a health viewpoint. I could go on, Michael, but in the interest of time, I'll save that for question. That's great. Uh, we're going to start to flip over to some of the questions from the group, but as those start to flow in, let me just put up a quick poll, and again, in the spirit of interactivity. You know, Kevin, you laid out the five R's, and maybe uh, we can put the five R's back up. Uh, just ask people to reflect on their own lives and their own roles right now. Where are you spending your most time as a team, as a leadership? Uh, which stage? Uh, resolve, resilience, return, imagination, and reform. Uh, submit your results. Uh, it'll take a few seconds to uh, tabulate, but while that happens and while people uh, put in the poll, Kevin, uh, let me play devil's advocate for a second and take on uh, some of the questions we're getting. Uh, you know, one of the key things leaders got to do is be able to differentiate between hype, you know, and, 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 and what popular wisdom might say and what is a, a durable trend. Um, and, and so just to play devil's advocate, you know, how do we think, what makes us confident that this isn't, um, you know, just a disruption in time and that two years from now, four years from now, we'll be all taking cruises again and uh, it'll be back to the, the old way. What, what makes us think this might be different or how might you advise leaders to, to think about differentiating hype from reality? Well, the, the great thing about forecasting the future is the only thing you know is you'll probably be wrong. So I, rec I start with that reality check. And I also recognize that there's going to be naturally reactions that we cannot anticipate. But let me offer a few things to put, to dimensionalize at least how to think about the situation in which we find ourselves. If you think about the scale of this challenge, then you have to think about uh, a reality from an economic viewpoint that the hit to the global economy is by far bigger than anything we've seen since the end of the Second World War. It may actually rival that, which is an astonishing thing to say, but that is a factual statement. Just look at the hit we are taking right now Look at the size of the bailouts that governments are talking about, either two trillion or three trillion in the case of the United States. It makes the Marshall Plan look like a small episode in human history. That is a massive intervention by government and a similar number in Europe. Smaller number, it's only 500 billion, but if you think about all the other things they're doing around it, it adds up and you get national governments involved. So the scale of government intervention in and of itself is enormous. We haven't seen anything like that in recent years, in, in living memory, you could argue for most people. And when you think about it that way, just think about what's the consequence of that? What's the consequence? The government puts that money into the system and we all return to normal? Well, the problem with that is that's not how economics work. Somebody's gonna have to fund this in due course. Maybe it's a bridging loan and everybody comes back and we're all okay, but just possibly this is gonna change taxation. Just possibly this is going to change the amount of the economy that the government either owns or influences. Just possibly the citizenry who've watched this all happening will want to hold somebody to account. In the 2008-2009 great financial crisis, the ability to hold somebody to account was easy. Everybody blamed the banks. Who are they going to blame this time? Who are they going to blame? Do we think when all this is said and done, there isn't going to be a settling of accounts where inquiries get held into how was the money used? that was pumped into the system. Who profiteered and who didn't? I think there's gonna be a lot of inquiries and they're not gonna get resolved overnight. We're not just gonna all wake up and say, okay, let's go back to where we were. That's why I think this is profound. The piece of the jigsaw that I think we may be surprised by is the resilience of the human. 
I think human resilience is incredible. And I do agree that it is very possible that people decide they want to live a life that they yearned for before. So I do think people will go back to restaurants. I do think people will go back to traveling, but I think they'll do it differently. And I think they will ultimately adjust their behaviors in many respects. But beha pure behavior, I think, is the most difficult thing to predict. But some pieces are less difficult. Are we going to go back to wanting to pay everything with cash when we've just had this contact-free, contactless payment boost right around the world because people don't want to touch a screen? I don't think so. I think cash is going to really have, cash is important in terms of having money to pay people, but probably physical cash has just seen its best days disappear. And actually, are we going to go back to wanting to shop in crowded stores all the time? Possibly, sometimes, but not as often as we did before. So you see these behaviors start to change. Interestingly, I do think holidays will come back, but it's possible that they'll come back regionally first. And then people will get comfortable and then they'll explore again. So I don't pretend that everything, it's a new dawn for every sector, every aspect of human life. But I really would challenge us to think hard about how reasonable it is or is not to assume we're going to go back to doing things the way we did them before. And my view, pretty fundamentally, the role of government is going to change. Attitude to contactless commerce is going to change. I think attitudes to privacy will change if people think it gives them a chance of better health or not. Maybe they'll make different trade-offs. Different parts of the world will take that differently. But I think we're already beginning to see people are willing to trade off a bit of personal privacy if their health is protected. Not in everything, but in many things. I do think we can expect a backlash, so people will be judged on the decisions they made in these difficult days. Did they make the right decision or the wrong decision? I do think we're going to see a change in the way people prioritize resilience over efficiency. A lot of the businesses that are set up and operate today are based on efficiency, i.e. we can move things quickly and at low cost. Possibly we're now going to think about, can we move them reliably, sustainably, and with confidence as to where they come from, given we now care a lot more about where things have been. So it's worth challenging the assumption we're going to go back. I understand the devil's advocate argument, but I think there's going to be a lot of change. And I stand by what is, after all, an assertion that people will talk about before coronavirus and after coronavirus because of the degree of change we are going to see. That's great. I want to hit on this tone uh, on this point about accountability, Kevin. Um, obviously, that's the flip side of leadership, or that's part and parcel with leadership. And before I do that, I just want to talk about the poll real quick. And you know, I think perhaps unsurprisingly, I think over fifty percent of the audience uh, was in the resilience category. Yeah. Although it's interesting, you're starting to see you know a, a bit on the right hand side too, with I think almost thirty, almost thirty five percent starting to get into that mode. So that's in some ways very encouraging to hear. Um, it will reflect on some of this as we as we keep going. I did want to pick up a, a bit on the accountability point, you, you know, uh, and, and, and listen, you know, this was happening pre-crisis as well, it, obviously with social media, with lots of trends, society asking more from leaders, holding them to account. Again, you could get paralyzed by that if you think about all the potential consequences or, uh, you know, the fact that your decisions are being scrutinized. Any reflections, again, how should leaders think here as they balance the fact that, you know, people are scrutinizing their decisions with the reality that, you know, usually leaders have to act? Well, leaders do have to act. And the worst thing in a, in a crisis is not to, you know, is to actually just observe and admire and comment and criticize and not do. So leaders do have to act. I think it's vital to have a few things in mind, because I think if I can use the poll to illustrate this, the poll felt right to me. In other words, it's no surprise that two thirds of us are very much focused on making sure our response is right and that we've got the resilience of our business so we can survive through the, the current difficult times that we've got and we'll worry about the future later. But herein lies the rub. And I think the challenge for all is that we need to do both. We absolutely need to do both. Make no mistake, the first term, the first priority is health and safety, customers, colleagues and cash, get that right. But soon, and soon is already coming, we absolutely need to think about the future. And you can't, it's very hard for the same people to do both. And part of, I think, accountability is to recognize how you're going to divide up the tasks. I believe and we believe that it is very important to have a group led by senior leaders, the CEO, to be very focused on this resilience and response point, very focused. But you, then you need a group of colleagues who are a little step away from that, who are much more focused on the return, and another group who are focused on the long-term thinking. 
And that's the way I think it's going to work. Because I think if you try and have the same people split their heads around the notion of the resilience phase, really managing the business for the here and now, getting it back up and running, and then reimagining what it looks like for the future, I don't think one group of people can do all that. And I think one of the mistakes that people will make is if they try that, they're going to get into trouble because they're not going to make the right trade-offs. They're not going to be able to think about those trade-offs. And I think that is part of the accountability moment is to recognize that and find ways to divide the leadership and divide accountability accordingly. Because the accountability will come fast and it's going to take many elements. And therefore, having some guiding principles that help you think about the way in which you want to navigate choices is vital because you can't be in every decision. So I also think part of this is being very clear what principles are going to guide you. How are you going to think about the extent to which you're going to lean ahead on decision making and empower and give responsibility versus actually, you know what, we're going to keep some tight controls on the things where it could all go horribly wrong. So I think getting that balance right, having differential organization and real thinking going into each part of what needs to happen, it's vital. I don't think it can be done by one leadership team. Perfect. Um, you know, I, I think we're getting close to the hour here. Uh, I wanted to maybe just uh, end on two questions, um, and I'll let you answer them in, in whatever order you like. But, you know, obviously there are all sorts of different ways a leader can lead. Uh, there are different leadership profiles and qualities. Uh, what would you uh, give us as advice on what leadership styles you think are working? Uh, and then the last one, just, you know, what gives you hope? Any uh, any things you've seen that, that gives you a sense that we are going to move more to the last part of this uh, five R's? It, it won't be just a return to normalcy, uh, but actually an acceleration uh, and an emergence. So I'll, I'll leave you with those two. I think we'll definitely ask, answer the second one. Why, why we'd want to hope. But I think leadership styles, you know, you read at the beginning, first and foremost, this is a humanitarian crisis. That wasn't a disclaimer. That is a statement of what it is. I think the best leaders at the moment are displaying enormous empathy, understanding, and looking after the people they can look after first and not forgetting that that is job one and that everything they do starts from that. And I think some of the inspiring things I've seen, Arna Sorensen, who's the chief executive officer of Marriott Corporation, if you haven't seen it, go to YouTube, get the video of Arna speaking to his team shortly after he has to make a decision to furlough essentially two thirds, if not more of the Marriott workforce, because there's not a lot of people staying in hotels. And as you watch him talk about that and how he's thinking about navigating and leading, I think that gives you a sense of what great leadership looks like in this moment. So I would encourage everyone to go and have a look at that speech, that set of video comments that he gave. And I think this, that's, that's the leadership style I think people want to see. The second leadership style I think people want to see is optimism, not pessimism. There are so many reasons to be pessimistic. Don't get me wrong. I mean, you just go and have a look at the Johns Hopkins site. I look at it first thing every morning and it doesn't really cheer me up yet. So I'm hoping it will do. There's a few signs of, of plateauing and various other things that give me some, some reasons to do that. But I do think this is a time when it's important to be optimistic because there are reasons to be optimistic, which is maybe your, your second question. Why do I say that? Well, first and foremost, we are going to see the best of science. I think the amount of resource that's been put into both the vaccines, the antibodies, the testing, incredible resource, and it's going to pay dividends. I deeply believe it will pay dividends. It may not be as fast as we want it to or need it to, but it will pay dividends. And it's incredible to see the talent and the way in which the science community is now going to be leading us. And I do believe they will find something. And I do believe there will be a vaccine. I do believe there will be... Uh, a mass test for antibody. Uh, I do believe that testing for the virus itself will be done at scale and rapidly in a way that at the moment we're just getting our heads around, although it's beginning to happen. That should give us confidence. Science is an amazing part of human nature, science and innovation, and it's happening. Secondly, I do believe that there are wonderful examples of leadership happening. I talked about Arne Sorensen, but there's many others where people are showing their humanity. And I think we will now have a new appreciation for things we may have taken for granted the lives we lead, the things we prioritize, the human spirit, faith, lots of reasons I think that will shine brightly. I also believe that we're gonna find a way to actually remind ourselves international cooperation is needed. It can go in one of two directions. There's clearly reasons we can, we can actually do the opposite and portray people as being somehow or other the contributors to this rather than the helping to solve the crisis. But I think people are working across the borders to really try and solve 
and save lives. I think that's an important reminder of this world is globally connected. This pandemic swept the world. The world needs to solve it together. So I really hope we can recreate some of the multilateral institutions that must help us tackle this crisis. So I, I could go on. I think there are going to be enormous amounts of learning and discovery because of the horrible times in which we find ourselves. But, you know, it's almost trivial to remind, I'm going to use a quote from Churchill, which is why I went back to this optimist point. I think the pessimist is somebody who can find disappointment in every opportunity. The, op the, opportunity, the optimist is somebody who can find opportunity in every disappointment. This is a disappointment, it's a terrible tragedy, there's lots of reasons to be nervous. But I do think that together, there is so much work being done that I do believe ultimately will pay dividends and find new ways and new things to value that I really hope it will be good. And I also hope that the business world plays the part that I believe it will play because we're gonna show what it takes to restore the economies of the world, to bring products to market, to care for people in a very tangible sense. And that's what business does. So that's why I'm optimistic. Uh, with that, I, I can't think of a better ending point. I think we could have gone on and on and on about all these trends, uh, but Kevin, thanks for sharing these with us. Thank you. Uh, before we let folks go, I just wanted to say one thing beyond thank you for joining us and thank you to Kevin. In the spirit of kind of advancing the ball, I think as Kevin, you are uh, encouraging us to do, we always ask people to reflect and to maybe commit to an action they'll take differently um, and, and obviously share if you like. And then finally, I, I just, uh, again, well wishes and hopes that uh, you are all staying healthy and safe. Uh, as Kevin mentioned, a humanitarian crisis, perhaps like we haven't seen in any modern era. Uh, so we hope you are all keeping safe. And you know, please uh, feel free to come back to our virtual exchange sessions. We're hosting a number and uh, the team will show the, share the link in a moment. Thanks for spending the time. Be well. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, all of you. Goodbye. Thank you. All right, are we clear? We still have a few people still on. There we go.